First of all, thank the organisers for inviting me to such a warm place. Um, it's always slightly intimidating to go first, so I hope um, you know people will ask questions if I'm uh, obscure. I'm not sure I will be in places, and uh, if people want homework problems, I can produce homework problems. But I haven't as yet. It's very difficult for me to do so. Anyway, I want to talk about conformal invariants in quantum field theory. Um, I should emphasize that I will be talking, uh, whenever I get to, into details, in more than two dimensions. Conformal field theories in two dimensions is a very different topic. It's pretty mathematical, and there was a huge amount of work in this area uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm trying to talk here about the uh, stuff which is more relevant to more recent work, which applies to conformal field theories in more than two dimensions. Before we move on to such things, I need to set the sort of basis, so to speak. And a little bit of history first. I mean, conformal maps were defined in the 19th century. Uh, basically, these are maps which preserve angles rather than lengths. Um, but in the context of at least fundamental physics, conformal symmetry didn't really get going at all, basically in, until about 1909, where two people, namely Cunningham and Bateman, are actually were in the same place at the same time, namely Cambridge in England, showed that Maxwell's equations were invariant under conformal transformations. But uh, it never really had much impact on the development of physics at that time or the next 50 or so years, because uh, to a large extent uh, it was clear that conformal symmetry didn't seem to be relevant to the real world. As soon as you involve particles with mass, which of course are the kind of particles that we know about in most cases, uh, the conformal symmetry is broken. And also there are more theoretical difficulties associated with what happens to uh, the causal structure. But uh, let me start at the beginning and define what I mean by a conformal transformation. And basically you're considering a change of coordinates of the kind such that, uh, so I'm going to assume that some kind of metric with dx prime squared is going to be related to dx squared. And normally, you just say that these are equal to each other. But in this case, we allow the possibility of some overall scale factor. And there's some implicit metric in this, uh, what we use to tie the indices together. And this can be Euclidean, or it can be uh, Minkowski. Uh, most of the time, it won't matter too much which one we use, though of course later on it may become relevant. Now, in order to discuss what are the possible solutions of this kind of equation, as usual one looks at some infinitesimal version of this. So here we want to discuss uh, what are the possible forms for V. And uh, so we just plug this into this equation and work to first order and basically you get the following. And uh, where basic here I'm choosing omega squared is equal to 1 plus 2 c. Uh, now I want to find what the solutions of that equation are. It's one of these rather simple exercises. If we just contract indices, we'll find that this is equal to d sigma, where I'm using these indices mu and u, going, well, actually, most of the time, it's 0 to d minus 1, uh, because I always think of 0 as being the time component if we're dealing with a relativistic situation. And then, if we take a derivative of this equation, and where we add and subtract two other versions of the same equation where you've permuted various indices around. So if you do that, you can isolate the second derivative of V in terms of the things which appear on the right-hand side. So that there are, you take d alpha of this, and then you take uh, another copy of it with some permutation of indices and another copy, and you add and subtract these and you'll get the following. Uh, minus. Uh, so you can work out which ones are added and which are subtracted by what appears on the right-hand side here. 
So this expresses the second derivative of V in terms of a uh, single derivative of sigma. Uh, and then uh, what one needs to do is to contract this with d mu. And then, of course, we can use this equation here. Uh, and you will get, uh, when you do this, d minus 2, d alpha, d mu sigma, is equal to minus eta alpha. And so here you begin to see that things depend on what dimension you're in. In fact, if you just contract indices here, you'll get d minus 1 del squared sigma is equal to 0. Uh, so uh, the point is that we're going to assume now that del squared sigma is equal to 0, and then this implies, if d is not equal to 2, that d alpha d nu of sigma is equal to 0. Uh, so, of course, d equals 2 is different in this situation, uh, but if we're not in dimension 2, uh, you will then realize that two derivatives of sigma are zero, so it has to be linear in x, and that's easy to solve. <coughs> Minus, uh, well, just as a, putting in a factor of two here is immaterial, of course. Uh, however, so that's the solution for sigma, and then you can plug sigma back up into the equation for two derivatives of v, and then it's pretty easy to solve, and you'll find the, the following possible solution. This is the unique solution in more than two dimensions while restricting to flat spacing. So I'm always uh, assuming that we're dealing with a theory on flat space uh, plus So hopefully that's the consistent solution. So this is what we have. Now, of course, it's not e difficult to see, so this is just a translation. And I should have said that it's necessary that omega mu nu is equal to minus omega mu nu for this uh, thing to work. This is a rotation or accelerator transformation. This is a scale transformation. And this is a special conformal transformation. And of course, if we just put sigma equal to zero, then the contributions over here would be absent, and that just gives rise to the original uh, Lorentz group plus translations. And if we just count the number of parameters, there's d here, there's half d into d minus 1 here, and there's 1 here, and then d here. So if you add them all up together, you should get, I hope. So we'll try and see a way of understanding this a little more in, in a while. Now, of course, let me just briefly go back to two dimensions, because uh, I've obviously left a loophole there. Uh, in d equal to 2, Let's assume that we're dealing with a Euclidean metric. In that case, we can use complex coordinates and just write the metric in that form. And then it's the case that if we take z to z prime to be any function of z, thinking of z to z bar as independent, so this is some analytic transformation of z, then this will preserve this structure, uh, so this will go to f prime of z, f bar prime, z bar, d z, d z bar. So f there can be any function, so of course you have an infinite dimensional set of transformations which is tied up with the whole Virasora algebra. Now, this is all basic uh, kinematics, but let me just, uh, it's convenient in many situations to uh, write d mu v nu in two ways, namely sigma mu nu, 
and then a contribution which I write that's right over the gap hat to you. So this thing is linear in x, and of course this is linear in x as well. The basic uh, transformations themselves are quadratic, and uh, with a little bit of work, it's not difficult to see that if we take the separation between two points, we can write this as uh, equal to a half sigma x plus sigma y uh, at x minus y mu, and then plus a half omega hat mu mu. Uh, so I should write this at x because these, uh, and then minus a half uh, x minus one. And we get that. So the point is that this interval, when you consider a small conformal transformation, changes by a factor which involves the scale at both ends. And then plus, you think of this as a x-dependent rotation, so it rotates the thing at x and also rotates it at y. Uh, this is all infinitesimal, but then if you take the interval, the arc of x, uh, of x minus y squared, this is going to become sigma x plus sigma y, x minus y squared, or if I consider a finite transformation, the interval itself will change by the factors omega at omega at one end and then omega at the other end. So this is how the uh, space-time interval transforms. Now, of course, in ordinary uh, Lorentz transformations, these factors are just equal to one. Uh, to get this form is y introduced to omega squared at the beginning. Now, one transformation which plays a significant role in treatment of conformal symmetry is the idea of an inversion. Now, what I've described so far are continuous transformations which are close to the identity. Sorry, yeah. Well, I, I define well, what omega hat is. It's defined by that equation, but basically omega hat mu nu of x is equal to omega mu nu, but because it involves a derivative of this quantity, these terms here come and play a role, and if I've got my factors correct, it's both T B mu nu. nu. So it's anti-symmetric in mu and nu, so if you like, it's a slight extension of the ordinary rotation. Omega mu nu is an infinitesimal rotation, but here I'm considering a rotation which depends on the point of where you're carrying it out. So in this situation here, I'm rotating this thing a little bit at x and a little bit at y. Uh, but of course, when you take x minus y squared, because like, the indices are being contracted, the rotation bits cancel out. But this will become relevant in a short while. Because I want to discuss how fields will transform. So I'm just defining the basic transformations. But I also want to discuss the notion of an inversion tensor. And this is a discrete transformation, which is also conformal, namely that x prime mu is x mu over x squared. So this is, uh, so the point here to notice that if I started with the point zero, this point x prime would be at infinity. Now it's not difficult to see that dx prime mu is equal to some tensor which I'll define in a moment, uh, which is all over x where this thing here is going to be equal to, well, uh, well, let's write it in the form the i mu nu of x is equal to a to mu nu. 
minus 2 over C. So this is what I will call the inversion tensor. And this will play quite a significant role. Now, uh, one thing one can note, by the way, is that if one considers, let's suppose we consider the following sequence of transformations. Supposing we do an inversion, and then we do a translation. So we do a transformation so this is all an ordinary translation. Then we do another inversion. So we do two of these inversions with a translation in the middle. And then we simplify this a little bit. Uh, but this, by the way, the fact that I've written this means that dx prime squared, uh, because it's easy to see that the square of the inversion tensor is 1, this is equal to dx squared over uh, x squared to the 4, and then this will become x mean plus b mean. So this is a finite version of the contribution here, it's hopefully not difficult to see that if I expand the denominator and keep terms only linear in B, you just produce these terms. So an inversion translation and then inversion is another way of getting what are called special conformal transformations. But of course, uh, if it's Euclidean, of course, the region x squared is zero. But the point is that it maps the point zero to a light curve. And it's tied up with if you want to, so if you compactify the space, um, namely if it's Euclidean, you just have to have a point at infinity, and then it becomes a sphere. If it's Minkowski space, you have to add a light curve to infinity, and then that's one way of defining what's called compactified Minkowski space. So, I mean, one has to think that x squared, if it's got Minkowski signature, x squared equals zero defines a null curve. So this is a way in which you have to think about such things. But uh, for the moment, I'm sort of skating over such issues. However, we're interested in fields. So how can we define uh, transformations on fields? Now note that in ordinary fields, uh, have a spin. Um, so I'm interested in fields uh, with a spin index r. You can make things a little bit more general than what I'm about to describe. But nevertheless, what I'm going to describe is something where we take fields which are defined in terms of ordinary Lorentz transformations and want to extend them to the situation where we're dealing with uh, conformal transformations. So in the case, so what I want to consider then is some modified field evaluated at the transformed point. Now initially I'm going to consider a situation where I'm dealing with a finite transformation and then later I'll specialize to a particular point. And then this is going to have two factors. There's going to be a scale transformation. And delta is going to be the scale of the field or its dimension. So, for instance, in four dimensions, a scalar field will normally have dimension one if it's a free field, but we have to allow for more general possibilities. 
And then we have phi j evaluated at x. And then if it were a Lorentz transformation, this would just be a rotation. But here we're going to introduce a rotation depending on x. So this is a rotation or a Lorentz transformation. And how is this object defined? Well, basically, I can define a, a transformation in the one way. First of all, I can find a rotation matrix in the following way, which is um, and then dx prime mu by dx mu. And now, of course, here these are Lorentz indices, and to define this, this is in the appropriate representation. So I'm presuming some representation to which these fields belong. And if we consider the infinitesimal case, uh, then we can write the RJI is going to be equal to delta Ji. So this is going to be the infinitesimal case. Then there's a bunch of spin matrices Ji. So these obey the appropriate uh, algebra, which they should do. And then we have this omega hat object, which depends on x, which is being given uh, somewhere. Uh, I wrote it down at the top of the board here. All right, so this, well, of course, to show that this is consistent, you have to verify that this is in accord with all the group properties. I haven't really said what the group properties are. Sorry? Password. Sorry, still for last word the first. Well, this is infinitesimal. Yeah. So I'm considering just the first order in this case. Um, so most of the time you work to infinitesimal. Now let me just write down what the form of a two-point function would be. Uh, in this case, I want to define for any field phi, there is a conjugate phi bar i. Um, so if we take the complex conjugate of a field, normally the spin representation will be different. And then we can write down... So the point is that in ordinary um, Lorentz symmetry, uh, there is a lot of freedom in writing this down. But here, there's essentially a unique thing you can write down up to an overall factor. Because of the scale symmetry, it must depend on the uh, x minus y uh, squared to the power of delta. And then, we have the inversion tensor. So this is the inversion tensor. In the appropriate representation. The point here is that initially you define this as an object. So this object belongs, if it's in Euclidean space, to the orthogonal group in d dimensions. If it's, you, if it's in Minkowski space, it belongs to some uh, Lorentz version of that, like O d minus 1 comma 1. And here, we can go from this to this by uh, using this in the appropriate representation. Well, um, this all begins to look a little complicated because of the uh, the fact that these transformations are non-linear, that these quadratic uh, terms seem to be uh, not as simple and straightforward as they are. So the ordinary Lorentz transformation which stops at this point is linear, and that's 
relatively easy to deal with. Um, what I'm trying to show here is, at least to some extent, when we go to fields, you take the same formalism that you would for uh, Lorentz transformations. In Lorentz transformations, this will be a constant, and here you just extend it a little bit to make it x-dependent. But what I'm going to describe now is a slightly different formalism, which actually was first introduced, as far as I'm aware, by Dirac around about 1935 where instead of having nonlinear transformations, you can make things linear at the expense of another slight complication, but a different kind of complication. So the, that's what I call is the embedding formalism. So instead of dealing with d-dimensional coordinates. So here these are d-dimensional. Uh, one goes to coordinates in a d plus two dimensional space. And I will show that we can define transformations on this d plus two dimensional space which are homogeneous and linear which reduce to conformal transformations. So basically, the index A here is going to be from 0 up to d minus 1, and then you add two more. And we want to define a metric on this space. So this is an extension of the ordinary metric, which may be Euclidean or it may be Minkowski. And then we add on, we need to treat these additional coordinates, so we have plus x d squared minus x. So that's going to be the metric on this space. And of course, if you're adding on two more variables here, so if we make this uh, equivalent to ordinary d-dimensional vectors, we have to impose some constraints. So the first constraint we impose that this is zero. So the point is, this is what might be called a null curve. Because even if this is Euclidean, there's a minus sign here. So we're considering a set of vectors which belong on a curve. And then that gets rid of one degree of freedom. And then we also identify any two things which differ by a scale. So lambda is just some overall scale. And so this is what is referred to when you make the theory projective. So if we don't care about the, of course this is a, if we had a non-zero number here, then we wouldn't be able to impose this condition, but because we have zero here, we're free to reparameterize these x's by an overall factor. Now hopefully, it's not difficult to see that if we have such a capital X subject to those two conditions, well one's not a condition, it's just an equivalence relation, uh, that we can consider transformations of the following kind, namely that this goes to G A B X B, where this is a homogeneous transformation, and this thing here belongs to the group O D plus one from one, if we're dealing with Euclidean space or O D comma 2. I mean, the point is, this is a set of orthogonal transformations which leave a metric with D plus 1 pluses and 1 minus, or in this case, D pluses and 2 minuses. Uh, and that depends on whether or not this A to mu nu has a minus in it if it's in Minkowski space.
So the point is this is the set of transformations which leave this null cone invariant. It doesn't care about the overall scale of X. Now, of course, this group here has dimension O d plus 1, d plus 2, which already matches the counting that I've already described. Now let's see if we can see how there's a connection between this and the uh, set of transformations that I defined earlier, which I call conformal transformation. So uh, let's note, by the way, that A to AB in this notation is A to the mu, comma 1, comma minus. So we've added in these two extra coordinates. And now it's convenient to define uh, x plus and minus to be equal to x d plus 1 plus and minus uh, x d. And then instead of, uh, in this case, the a to a b, xa, xb is equal to a to the x mu, x mu, minus uh, at the end, x plus, x minus. So now let's show you how to reduce this to uh, <coughs> reduce uh, this to transformations involving x, so with little x. So we need to define, so let's suppose x plus is not equal to zero, in which case I can define x mu is equal to x. Note, of course, that this definition of little x doesn't depend on the overall scale which I associated with capital X. Um, you can worry about what happens when x plus is equal to zero, but this effectively ties in with what happens at infinity. Uh, and so for the moment, at least, I won't worry too much about that. And then note that 2 a to mu x mu dx mu is going to be dx plus x minus plus x plus. So we uh, just take uh, d of this equation here and uh, because a to mu is symmetric. Now what you can then work out, and I won't actually go through the algebra it's a simple exercise to do, but if you work out that a to a b dxa dxb, that this, using this equation and everything, is become equal to x plus squared a to mu uh, dx mu dx mu. So, I mean, there's a little bit of algebra to show that, but not very much. Now, the point is that if we consider some transformation, xA to x prime a, a transformation of the kind here, then uh, it's clear that this object here is invariant under such a transformation from which it follows that dx prime squared is equal to x plus squared over x prime plus squared times dx. So the point is that the infinitesimal dx squared uh, transforms 
in the fashion up to an overall scale factor. So this factor here is what I call omega squared. So the point is that we can, if we wish, extend these transformations to this so-called embedding space. Embedding because the ordinary little epsilons are embedded in this bigger space. So the point is that any x corresponds to a line in, in here. So let's consider this line. This corresponds to a point x mu in the original Euclidean or Minkowski space. And so for some purposes, this is a useful uh, way to consider things. Uh, you can, if you want, make a choice of x plus is equal to 1, and then x minus is equal to x squared. And if you do make that choice, then you find, for instance, that if you take x dot y. Now note that this has to vanish when x is equal to y because it corresponds to things being on the null cone. Uh, but this, if you just plug things in, will be equal to minus a half x minus y squared. So this is the scalar product of two vectors on this uh, extended embedding space. And that's just related to the square of the difference between the two points when you reduce it to the original Euclidean or Minkowski space. Now, I've already said a little bit about fields over there, so let's equivalently talk about fields if we extend to this embedding space. So the point here is that we need to consider, let's originally do this for scalar fields. So let's do it for scalar fields so there are no indices. And we want to extend this to some field on the uh, null cone. So this x here. Satisfies the condition of x squared is equal to zero. But we have to ensure that when we do this, we do this in a way that respects the fact that we have this equivalence relation under scaling of these things. So you can't immediately assume that this is invariant. So if you're familiar with this kind of language, the fields belong to. <laughs> line bundles over this space rather than uh, fields directly on the space. So this is equal to lambda to the minus delta. So the point is that we don't say that the fields themselves are invariant under scalings of the x's, but they're parameterized by a number delta which we define to be the scale. Or this little phi over here. Remember the delta came in to the basic transformations which I was defining for a field under the action of conformal transformation. Let me, you can extend this to fields of spin. I'll only just consider one simple case. Let's consider a vector field. Now, the obvious thing to consider then is a field uh, with an extra index A here. And so we've already extended things from D dimensions to D plus 2. But we have to impose some conditions on capital V in order to ensure that it contains the same number of degrees of freedom. So there are two conditions, well, one natural condition to impose is that uh, this is, satisfies that condition, 
so this is one condition, but then we have to worry about the fact that the A of X, well, we have to say that it's an equivalence up to transformation. So this, of course, doesn't restricts any contribution to VA of the form which is proportional to X itself because X squared is zero. So we have to assume that these V's are only defined up to the addition of an arbitrary term proportional to X. So this is like a gauge symmetry. Well, let's call this a gauge transformation. Anyway, so uh, you can extend this to fields with more indices. You can extend this to uh, spinorial fields. I won't go into that detail here. Um, let me just make one other comment before I uh, go on to the next thing. Is that if you want to consider an inversion, so an inversion corresponds to a reflection on this embedding space. And for instance, if we interchange x plus and x minus, then going through the definitions that I've done, this is equivalent to doing an inversion, or it's equivalent to taking x d to minus x d. So it's a reflection, not including the original x's, but it's a reflection of these extra coordinates I've introduced to describe all this. Okay, now having linear homogeneous transformations, it's not so difficult to write down uh, what the Lie algebra of the relevant group is. So I don't want to go into too many details of this, but one needs to know some idea of the basic transformation. So let's consider the Lie algebra. And let's define uh, the obvious thing that you would write down for an orthogonal group. And I've been using the metric to raise the lower indices. You have to worry a little bit when you define derivatives with respect to these null coordinates because of this condition that x squared is equal to zero. It's not completely uh, trivial, but at least as far as this LAB is concerned, uh, it's okay because of the way these things come together. The point is that if we add some contribution here proportional to XB, it will cancel out in this difference. Anyway, and then we can define... So if we think of these fields as operators, Uh, we can define this as equal to LA. Uh, and then I can work out what the, the algebra is. And, um, well, should add, of course, that this is anti symmetric. Each of these pairs of indices, it's anti-symmetric. And what we get here, well, if the signs are correct, it's N to A C M B D. And then three more terms, which you can easily obtain just by adding the contributions where you interchange C and A with a minus sign and B and D with a minus sign. So that, that will give you the remaining terms. Now let's actually reduce this back to the original uh, D dimensions. Well, here I'm tacitly zooming phi as an operator in which this M is an operator. Operator what? Well, operator.
elaborate on the uh, space of states of the quantum field theory. Okay, and I'll come to that in a little bit. But uh, uh, so I'm assuming that we we've got this. We did, we've gone to a quantum field theory situation where the fields themselves are operators, and there's a space of states in which they act, which I haven't really defined in any detail as yet. But let me now reduce this. So we now go back. So the point is that the indices A can be reduced to and then let's write the MAB. Well I'll write it in matrix form. Remember this is anti-symmetric, so the A indices is going downwards and the B indices is going across. And there's an M mu nu. So for the decomponent indices here, this reduces to the uh, original uh, matrix here. Now we have some additional things, which, well, again, some, some issues of sign conventions here, but in a convention which I find convenient, you can smuggle in various minus signs here and there. But, uh, so the point is that And then the rest of it is effectively determined by anti-symmetry. So this should be new. Uh, and then half. Uh, new. So the diagonal elements have to be zero, and then we do find D. So in this thing, the P is going to be the translations. K mu is for special conformal. And D is for scale. And really it's just an algebraic exercise to substitute this into there, to break this down into uh, the original components. Now, I won't write them all down, uh, but you will get the following, namely that k mu p mu is going to be equal to 2 m u mu with plus 2 a d times d and d with p mu is equal to p mu and d with k mu is equal to minus k those signs are important and then there's various other transformations which involve the ends, which I'll just write down one of them. I mean, D is a scalar, so it commutes with M. And, well, let's just write down one. M mu with P sigma is equal to A to mu sigma. So it's anti-symmetric the mu and nu. So this is basically saying that p is a vector. There's a similar one where you just replace p by k. We have m with d is zero, and m with n is equal to four n. So the one m with n is just a straightforward copy of that one there with the indices changed. So what we're interested in then is defining the quantum field theory in such a way that
that we can have these operators generating a symmetry on the theory. So let's now go back to the case of dealing with fields. And we... Sorry, I shouldn't have made it. I shouldn't have run that one out, but still. So we want to deal with uh, fields. Well, actually, let me define, first of all, I want to be able to show how we can define the energy momentum tensor and so on in a conformal field theory. So for the moment, let's go back to the um, classical situation. And let's suppose that we have, so I want to use Noether's theorem. give you an energy momentum tensor. And then the energy momentum tensor will be such that if it's a uh, quantum field theory, we can use this to, to, to construct operators which satisfy these various commutation relations. So let's go back. So Noether's theorem is a general theorem which tells you when you've got a continuous transformation uh, acting on fields under which the um, action is invariant, then there is a corresponding conserved current which you can use to uh, construct the generators of this particular algebra in a quantum case. So let's go back to the case of... So we, so I'll, I'll do this in a way which is maybe slightly unconventional, but not very much. But anyway, so I want to consider an action constructed out of fields such that delta V on phi i is equal to V dot del on phi i. So here we're considering a V mu which is satisfying the equations I wrote down earlier, which can be expressed in terms of these 15 parameters, uh, and then plus phi j times half s u nu j i. So this is a spin rotation. So the s's obey the same algebra, finite dimensional algebra, as the m's do. And we have plus omega hat. So the hat denotes the fact that things are depending on x. And uh, then we have this extra term. So delta times sigma. So delta is just a number times phi. So all these things depend on x. So v depends on x. The field depends on x. That depends on x. Omega depends on x. So does sigma. So this is a local transformation where we transform the coordinates. So this is a uh, rotation, if you like. This is a scale transformation. And this is an x-dependent translation. And note that there is a condition Um, which is that the uh, d mu v nu is going to be equal to h mu sigma minus omega hat. So this is how I define the scale transformation and also omega hat in terms of the original v. Remember, v is not a free thing. Well, it's about three or four minutes to 11. Um, rather than go into the actual calculation involving Noether's theorem, I mean, it doesn't take terribly long, but perhaps I'll leave it there and just ask if there are any questions, and we'll start that at the beginning of the next lecture. If we could leave this on the board. Are there any queries so far? Entirely too difficult or too easy. Okay. Do you want me to carry on with 
Não é capaz de isso. Ou não? Well, let me just start it and then we'll see where we go from there. And then I will finish at 11 so you all can get a cup of coffee. So the point here is that we want to extend the transformations So, we want to consider transformations on the action. So this is an action which is constructed in terms of the fields, in terms of their the fields, their derivatives, and we're assuming that it's invariant under conformal transformations. But now I want to relax the conditions of making V, omega, and sigma just any old translation, any old rotation, any old scale transformation, depending on x. So what conditions does that impose upon the action? So this action is a local quantities constructed out of the fields at some particular point. So we can express it in the end in the following fashion namely d mu v nu plus omega mu nu minus sigma h d nu times t mu nu. The fact is, you see, if it's conformal transformation, this thing there vanishes. But actually, we can add another term. We can add a term in here plus the alpha omega mu plus d mu sigma times d mu sigma and eight. Oh, I should have. I'm sorry, I have to think out. I should have had eight alpha mu. <coughs> then remember, this is anti-symmetric of mu and mu. Anyway, the point is that uh, this relationship here will itself imply a relationship between sigma and this will imply that the alpha of omega hat is equal to uh, minus e. So the point is that subject to those two conditions, the action should be invariant. That's the hypothesis that we're making that this is a conformal theory. It means that if you relax those conditions and consider a variation, uh, then this is the general form of what a, such a variation uh, can take. As long as you have the assumptions that this is a local theory constructed out of fields at some particular point, uh, so this is just an integral over x. So all of these quantities, so these are free, so this is v nu of x. And we give you nu of x. So I'm considering a infinitesimal translation, rotation, scale transformation, but without any relationship between those things. But if there was such a relationship, we would get zero. Okay, well I'll finish at this point, and with that set of equations, I can then uh, deduce in a moment uh, what the form of the engine moment and tensor and so on are. Okay.